this a Minakata Kamagusu, is that right? How'd I do? Pretty good. Um, a Buddhist biologist from early 20th century Japan. Um, Uh, and then afterwards, for those who are willing to brave the cold, um, we'll go to the heated tent um, at Downward Dock for um, appetizers and drinks. So uh, Dave can take it away, or Dave can take it away, and then he's going to pass it out to Sarah. Thank you. Um, I realize it's almost 14 years since I talked in this room last. Wow. As a, I've not talked since I moved to Corvallis. Oh, so I was going to talk about divergence and convergence of the tree of life oceanic ground beetles, uh, two different stories, but I, uh oh, it's not responding. Do what? Click on the, pre you mean, yeah, the mouse, right, right. So just forget this thing. Oh, I see. Okay. It was a focus issue. No, it wasn't a focus issue. Okay. Oh, oh, that was backwards. I was pressing the wrong button. Okay, okay. so um, I was gonna tell you two tales. Uh, one tale about intertidal beetles that involved convergence, but I decided to focus instead on a story about divergence. And in particular, about the mysterious Bambidines of St. Helena. So Bambidines are ground beetles. Uh, it's the group that has taken my heart since 1975. It's a diverse group of beetles. I've spent a lot of time over the last decade working out the phylogenetic tree of the world fauna. I know a lot of aspects of the broad picture and fine details. This shows the general structure with a very large genus Bambidion and a few smaller genera, satellite genera, as it were. Uh, oh, God. Um, and I'm going to show you pictures of a couple of these. So here are some of the smaller genera, Lyonifa. This is the species that I discovered three days after I arrived in Oregon in 2009 on Mary's Peak. Asaphidion is another one of the smaller genera. But as I said, the vast bulk of species are in Bambidion. There's about 130 species in Oregon, about one tenth of the world fauna. And I think they're lovely creatures. This is the belt buckle beetle. That's one of our locals uh, on the Pacific beaches. This is uh, Bibian core genoma, our genomic model organism from the Willamette. And uh, they tend to live on the bodies of shores uh, of various sorts of water. Uh, including river shores where many species can coexist together. They're at the edges of marshes and on ocean shores. So one of my favorite things is this tree of Bambidion. We've got about 900 species so far in the phylogeny. And there's so many tales that I could tell you that are revealed by the shapes of this tree and uh, thinking about the evolution of characteristics upon it. But again, I'm just going to tell you one little story, which is uh, about the mysterious Bambidines of St. Helena. So St. Helena is an island in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. It's a long way from anywhere. It's about 1,300 kilometers from the nearest island and about 1,800 kilometers from the mainland, uh, the nearest point being on Africa. It's Napoleon's place of exile. It's where he died. The island is about 17 kilometers in length. It's volcanic. It's been above water at least 14 million years. The last major eruption was 7 million years ago, and that was, that's expected to have wiped out the flora and fauna that was there at the time. It has an amazing endemic flora, including these cabbage trees, which are asteraceae, and uh, some tree ferns. It's got a wonderful invertebrate fauna, too, including this arboreal isopod and the world's largest earwig, which is about up to eight oh, centimeters God. long. Uh, the, the, the stuff of nightmares. But the bambidines, of course, are what I love here. And the thing that's shocking about these bambidines are that the body forms of these beetles are more diverse within St. Helena than the rest of the world fauna of the group. 
And for those of you, you, might, you don't know bimbidines, but I look at this and none of those look like bimbidines to me. Unlike most of the world bimbidines, they don't live along bodies of water. They live in forests. And in particular, they live on the forests on the top of the peak. There's basically just one long peak on top of St. Helena. And they live in rotting tree fern logs where they feed on insect larvae. And they are small. They are not like the earwig. The bimbidines of St. Helena were classified into three genera. They were viewed as, as members of that cluster of satellite genera outside of bimbidion. And this is what the members of those genera look like. Uh, here's six of the nine species of Pseudophylloxus. Here's one of the two species of Apteromimus and the only species of Endosomatium, uh, which that's just weird. So how did this incredible diversity of bimbidines arise? Is the diversity old? Did it arise before St. Helena? And that actually was the, the view by people who knew this group well is that, is that this is representatives of a very old radiation that happened outside of St. Helena and that independent stocks made their way across the ocean to, to St. Helena. An alternative hypothesis that was proposed is that it was a single invasion with in situ diversification, but that it was a, a group, a, an old group from outside Bambidian. So I, when I first started thinking about doing DNA work and, and was really interested in figuring out the phylogeny of Bambidians, this was one of my primary targets. And I dreamed of going to St. Helena. Um, uh, I, I actually wanted to see if there was actually specimens available already for DNA work, if somebody had collected them in ethanol or silica gel, but there didn't seem to be anything in any of the world's museums of that sort. And there was nobody local on St. Helena. It's got a population of about 4,000 who, uh, who had collected any of them recently. So I dreamed about getting there. And at the time, the only way to get there was to take a five day voyage on the Royal mail ship from Cape Town five days and then five days back. And I was plotting and dreaming and, uh, but then a colleague relayed a message to me. Uh, Very naughty. <laughs> uh, alas, that wasn't the message that was relayed. And the message that was relayed was not nearly so joyful. It was that, uh, oh, now we're out of, okay. The tree fern forests are almost entirely gone and that the beetles are almost certainly extinct or at least almost all of them. And that's the result of, of clear cutting and invasive species. And that reflects the patterns of collecting. If you look at the old records when many species were found and then Belgian expeditions, primarily in 1967 in which they found a number of the species. And that was through 211 days of general insect collecting, but worse when Howard Mendel went back there over the winter of 2005, 2006, he did 30 days focus collecting, looking specifically for these beetles and found one specimen. And so the expectation is, is that these things are extinct, except for possibly the one species that Howard found. Um, 
I might note that there's a benefit of all this extinction is that this is gone too now. Uh, for those of you who, who are terrified of earwigs. Uh, so what to do? And I just basically dropped it until uh, I realized the power of these Illumina sequencing machines, which sequence fragmented DNA. These wondrous things allowed me to borrow specimens from the 1967 expedition. And also for one specimen that had been collected in the mid 1880s from the Natural History Museum in London. And these are the specimens that I sequenced. And this is actually post extraction, post DNA extraction. Oops. And this is what we ended up, what I ended up getting. Uh, basically, these are what's at the top here, the genes that we were looking at for this particular study. And this shows how many bases uh, we got, how long the fragments were uh, that we sequenced. And it's really, it just blew me away. For these two specimens, we've got almost the entire ribosomal cistron. And for these two specimens, and remember, this is the 1880s specimen, we got the entire mitochondrial genome. So where does, can we get rid of this? Okay. Um, so uh, could this allow us to solve the mystery of these beetles? Uh, is it independent invasions? No. Was a single invasion with diversification from outside of Bambidion? No. The data are very, very strongly supporting that it's basically a single invasion diversification well within Bambidion. And if we zoom in on the phylogeny, and let's just get rid of the extra Bambidion there, that these beetles are form a small clay deeply nested within Bambidion. And that the near relatives is, are, is this group that look for all the world like just any other Bambidion, uh, subgenus Omataphis. Subgenus Omataphis is an African group. It's found throughout Africa and it lives along river and stream shores. So it seems very plausible that an omataphis like ancestor made its way to St. Helena and diversified into all of the forms that we see today. And this to me is very much like the Darwin's Finches story, except that there's a few curious differences and I think notable differences. One is that this is not an archipelago. This is just one island and that all that radio, all that diversification happened in situ in the context of very little uh, topography within this one place. And the other thing that's notable is that these beetles are so different one from another that people didn't even think they're related. So these are dramatically different, uh, a, a dramatic amount of evolution within one very small geographic area. How did the ancestor get to St. Helena? Well, if you look at air currents, uh, and this was one day in 2009, the air currents, you can easily imagine them going, uh, making their way to St. Helena. And most omataphis alive today are winged, they can fly. Ocean currents might also be a source. There's St. Helena, the little white dot down here. They might've come on ocean currents. Um, of course, other things come on ocean currents, uh, including uh, larvae of, of sea anemones. What does this have to do with Aptasia? Well, it has nothing to do with Aptasia, but this does. Oh, yeah, I think that was it. Well, close enough. Okay, so another <laughs> thing you might wonder is, can Bambidion actually survive an ocean uh, voyage if currents were the, were the source? So salt tolerance, Bambidions, many Bambidions are salt tolerant. Um, there are numerous species that live in saline lakes, inland saline lakes. There are actually intertidal species that live deep within rock cracks and are fully submerged at high tide. 
There are other radiation, there's several radiations of species that are intertidal in uh, mud, sand, gravel, or cobble. And there's others that are just above the high tide line and go down into the intertidal zone to forage, such as this locality in New Zealand. Speaking of New Zealand, <laughs> Thank you. That's the end of my story. <laughs> We do, do we do any, any quick questions at the end yeah, that we yeah, do? Yeah, Does anybody have a question? Yes. How, how long do you think they made the move? Oh, good question. Uh, so one thing that we're in the middle of doing is trying to date the divergence times of the phylogeny, and we haven't got that yet done yet. There, there are relatively few fossils in this group that can really help with that, that dating, but that's ongoing. So I don't, I can't really answer that yet. Mark. Did you have enough samples to assess like any population genetic um, measures? No, no. I, I I was reluctant to extract DNA from too many specimens given that they're extinct. And endosomatium, the one with the big head, that was the specimen that I borrowed from the British Museum that was from the mid 1880s. I think there are only three specimens of that known. So where do you extract the DNA from? The whole body. It's, it's a, it basically, you, you're, uh, you, you put it, the extraction buffer and the enzymes just clean out the soft tissue and you have the exoskeleton left over. Okay. Wow. So. What was the story with the invasives? Like how did this all develop it? The particular I thing think, is? so the, there's a number, I think it was in the 1500s that I think it was the Dutch that first landed there and they brought in goats. Uh, to feed later people that came in. So that was pretty devastating. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of it has to do with the plants that were brought in. Uh, uh, there was flax was brought in to be, uh, to, to support, to actually be used for the local industry. And now that's everywhere in there. It's, it's basically through the understory of the tree fern forests and and then of course, just the farming has just cut down so that the only forests left are just these little little bits at the steepest places where you can't farm anymore. Yep. So it was the, from the 1500s to sometime in the 1900s where most of the devastation happened. And then now they're very concerned about it. Like the, the environmental movement is very strong there now, but they've lost most everything already. Sure. <laughs> Do you know anything about the indigenous people who were there prior to? There, there apparently were, there was no, there wasn't anybody. It was empty when the Dutch arrived. Okay. Yeah, thank you, David. Sure. Um, um, so, yeah, I guess we're going to transition, Teresa. Yeah. We're going to stop the share here. Stop the share. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. So yes, I know. I I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> okay, there's Sarah. Do I pin her? Is it pin or spotlight? All right. Hi, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. And I think I got the audio thing figured out. So hopefully we're good there. Sorry, I'm giving this talk remotely. I wanted to be there in person, but uh, my whole family has COVID. So <laughs> we got it brought home from preschool last week. We're all fine. Um, but uh, we're in quarantine. So um, I'll be talking about the other outbreak today though, and I will be covering a 
some data from a project that I started in my PhD actually, and um, joined the Mangi Lab as explicitly to study, um, and that's the sea star wasting disease outbreak. And I'll be showing you some data that we've been, you know, working on collecting over the last um, seven or eight years now. Um, and the title is Geographic Variation in Keystone Predation. And this is with a bunch of folks, uh, mostly Santa Cruz researchers and uh, Concordia University down in LA. So as many of you probably know, the sea star wasting disease outbreak um, started in 2013, 2014 in Oregon, and uh, was devastating. It killed um, 60 to 90% of Pisaster in Oregon, 99% of Pycnopodia, the sunflower sea star in Oregon, and uh, had a similar devastating effect from Mexico to Alaska. It killed about 20 species, uh, we think, and it's likely that it was caused by a virus. There's been some uh, debate about that, but some of the more recent stuff that isn't published yet from a colleague is pointing to virus. Um, it's still out there, but it's not at outbreak levels anymore. Um, and as devastating as this was, it was a really amazing natural experiment to enable us to test some really fundamental ecological concepts because it didn't just affect any species, right? It affected the keystone original keystone species, Pisaster ocratius, um, which as everyone learns in intro ecology is uh, a keystone predator and it controls its community's structure um, mostly by eating stuff. So it eats all sorts of different organisms, including snails, limpets, barnacles, and it especially eats mussels. So it has the strongest effect on mussels and mussels are the bullies of the intertidal. They are superior competitors for space. They form these big beds um, and they just kind of elbow everybody else out of the room uh, uh, and take over if given the opportunity. Uh, at least that's how the story goes, right? And so <clears throat> because they then compete with all these species for space, when we have a decline in Pisaster due to sea star wasting, we would expect that keystone predation uh, effect to weaken for mussels to take over and for all sorts of other stuff to decline in abundance. And so, but um, the keystone predation concept was developed over like one rocky bench on Tatouche Island in Washington. So, um, you know, it's super powerful and clear and it's been replicated, but we don't know how widespread uh, this effect is. And so sea star wasting is, you know, the perfect natural experiment to test that exact concept. And so today um, I'll cover very top, you know, briefly and at surface level, how communities have changed since sea star wasting disease, ask whether mussels have indeed taken over as we would expect, have other mussel competitors uh, declined and has diversity itself declined. And then because when we know the answers to those questions, we can interpret whether keystone predation itself is a widespread phenomenon. So we did this study, like I said, with a bunch of different folks, but we had 33 sites from, um, from Cascade Head down to Orange County. So down to uh, Southern California. And this is why our lab has been tired for three and a half years. <laughs> or maybe eight. <laughs> uh, we did a lot of things at the sites, but the data I'll show you today was from these fixed vertical transects. So we sank uh, steel bolts at the high and the low end of fixed lines, and we revisited those lines every uh, year, and there were five lines at each site at least. And we took um, photographs all the way up each transect. And today I'll focus just on those photographs that are on the lower portion of the inner tidal zone, so at and below the lower edge of the original muscle bed, because that's where we expect the action to happen, right? If the, keys, if the muscles are gonna take over, they're gonna take over downward where they um, used to get eaten. So we do this um, with a lot of photographs. We've analyzed like over 5,000, I think. Um, and this is just an example of one that's on Point Conception down in California. And it started in 2018 with this small patch and this photo quad program, um, if y'all graduate students need some cool way to analyze some photos, is a really neat uh, freeware that helps you analyze quadrats in all sorts of great ways. 
And you can see over time, the next year, this muscle bed got a little bigger, a few little muscles settled, and it got even bigger the next year. And then now it's covering a good chunk of the plot. And so I am going to show you data that are all gonna look like this for different taxa. Um, and all of them are oriented from north up at the top of the graph. So this is Cascade Head um, and all the, or blue is Oregon. Um, and then you've got Northern California sites, Central California sites and Southern California sites down here in red. Um, and then each panel is a different species. So we've got some barnacles up here and mussels, which we'll talk about first right in the middle. And then the bars are the, the change in um, proportion cover of each of those taxa averaged over, depending on the site, like three to five years. So if uh, a bar is tiny, like right in here, that means no change in that cover of that taxon. And if the bars are going to the right, that's an increase. And if the bars are going to the left, that's a decrease. So what you can see is for mussels, our star prey, um, we have had mussel takeover at a lot of sites in Oregon. And um, that is exactly what the keystone predation hypothesis would expect, right? Less sea stars, more mussel takeover. But that has not happened down in Northern California. If anything, they've declined. Um, and then as you go into Central California, it becomes spotty, some sites take over, some sites not. And then you get back into Southern California and you see that keystone predation thing pop back up again with a muscle takeover. So strange, right? Um, not exactly what we expected and a lot more variation than we anticipated. And the um, other part of the keystone predation hypothesis is that muscles take over everything else decreases. But in fact, when we look at the data, the gooseneck barnacles, which are another uh, prey of Pisaster, and the acorn barnacles, which are another prey, actually responded similarly to the mussels. So they're actually being released from predation, at least in Oregon, and then elsewhere not responding so much, except for maybe Southern California. And then large barnacles like Tetraclida, semibalanus, um, have the opposite trend in Oregon where they're declining maybe because of muscle competition or competition with all sorts of other stuff um, and not really being affected elsewhere. So what we're seeing are some evidence for the keystone predation effect coming to fruition, but it's not happening everywhere. And it's not necessarily that a muscle takeover and everyone else declines story. Okay, so now that those are the main prey, we'll go over to some other species of interest. And the two on the left are both mollusks that are eaten by Pisaster, but aren't like their favorite. And um, in fact, Nucella predatory mollusks right here often compete with Pisaster for food. And so, and then we have sea urchins, which are a major space holder and sea anemones, which are also a major space holder. And so what we can see is some geographic variation, but um, our river mollusks have had a good couple of years. They've been increasing, maybe due to release of predation pressure. Um, predatory mollusks, not so much. They've actually declined, which is really interesting. And I'm trying to wrap my head around this one. Um, and then sea urchins and anemones haven't really responded all that much. Um, so they haven't necessarily benefited from or, or been harmed by the muscle changes. And then if we go over to algae, so we've got a lot of different uh, groups of algae and I'm not gonna worry about individuals too much, just know that we're separating them into mostly phyla or like, um, sub phyla with like big differences between corallins and non coral and algae. And what we'd expect to see, none of these are eaten by Pisces, right? So what we'd expect to see is them um, decline if muscles take over. And we're not necessarily seeing that. And we've actually got all sorts of interesting and um, unexpected things happening. So uh, let's for example, say a red canopy algae actually haven't changed much in Oregon. If anything, they're increasing, but they're really doing great in um, NorCal and SenCal. Uh, on the other hand, fucoid algae, which are brown algae, have declined in NorCal and SenCal, but haven't uh, strongly changed as much in Oregon. So 
we've got algae going all over the place. And I, I could spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> pontificating about what I think are the mechanisms behind all these. I'm not going to do that today, but we're going to be analyzing a lot of this with uh, like a community model with Tarek Gouillet at Northeastern to try and untangle a lot of these relationships. But uh, time is not in this, right? So what actually happened to mussels over time? That's what we really, you know, that's the keystone predation question. And um, if you look at the data from 15 to 20, uh, mussels actually have increased generally. So all these lines are mostly positive or, or neutral, right? but not decreasing. And the strongest one uh, increases are in Oregon and maybe SoCal. And that really matches that, that graph a moment ago. Um, but you know, the keystone predation effect is, is all about diversity, what maintains diversity. And what we see is it's not super strong, but diversity in general has declined. And it was actually strongest in Oregon where we have that decline in diversity with the muscle takeover. So that's your uh, keystone predation uh, result. And it's stronger in Oregon and SoCal. And when I, I'm actually interested, especially in what's going on in NorCal and SanCal, because there was this humongous upheaval of the food chain, but they've uh, apparently are resistant to that change. And so that's actually a really interesting like climate change and um, just uh, fishing down the food web question, like how did that maintain its stability despite this disturbance? And then the take home for me really is that the keystone effect is not necessarily as ubiquitous as we tend to um, teach it to be. And there's a lot of other stuff going on and it's not all about Pisaster and it's not all about muscles. And, you know, of course it's complicated, but we're gonna dig into those complex interactions um, as we go deeper into all this data. Thanks. Um, and just to say like, this is a huge project, lots of people, graduate students, techs from Santa, uh, Santa Cruz and OSU have worked on it. And um, speaking of fantastic graduate students and collaborators, Happy birthday, Virginia. <laughs> hey, Virginia. Can you see her? Happy it? birthday from sunny Florida. Hope you have a wonderful birthday. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful mentor and a great friend. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hi, Virginia. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Ellen and I wanted to record a message. I wanted to thank you for connecting me with her and keeping the Virginia Weiss family going. Yes, thank you, Virginia. I've appreciated your support all throughout graduate school and now into my career. <laughs> Happy birthday, Virginia. Any questions for Sarah? I have a question. Sarah, can you hear me? Sort of, talk loud. Uh, yeah, so in areas that Pisaster has started to rebound, are you starting to see that effect in muscles? Like in Oregon and SoCal? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the muscles have taken over, and there are places where Pisaster have rebounded now. Um, and they are attempting to knock the beds back, but a lot of the beds have actually gotten so big that they're pretty resistant to predation. And the sea stars themselves aren't big honkers. And so um, muscles, when they hit, you know, bigger than like your thumb, start to get more and more and more resistant to predation unless that sea star is, you know, huge and big enough to eat it. And so I think a lot of these beds that have... Um, taken over at least the ones that took over quickly and now the muscles are big aren't going to go anywhere i think they're going to stay because they're um now big enough that they're not vulnerable they're trying though the sea stars are trying <laughs> sarah i don't know if you 
see anything in the chat, but um, oh, see it, so. I can read it. Hold on. I can only see happy birthday wishes, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any theories about the Northern California sites yet? Um, I think sea star, I think Keystone predation was not that big of a deal to begin with there. I mean, there's plenty of sea stars there around, but I did my PhD. I actually started this inadvertently before, um, sea star wasting disease started because I was looking at how, um, temperature, air temperature weakened the Keystone predation effect. And I was finding that, um, that when you have temperature stress, which uh, a lot of folk places down in, in Northern California do have, you had muscles dying, not because of sea stars, but because they just were not able to survive in that spot. And so um, I think there's other factors that are limiting beds down there besides sea stars already. And then when wasting happened, you know, some sites got some good muscle years and some good recruitment and had some takeover, but most sites that they didn't even blink because this, they were already limited by something else. I don't know what's going on in SoCal though. <laughs> Those should be the hard, hottest and hardest for muscles to survive. And they're the ones that bounced back. So that one's uh, a little more curious. Francis had a, uh, oh yeah. Francis says, how do you separate the effects of pies ester loss from the effects of the environmental change, e.g. the multiple marine heat waves? Um, we can't super easily. So that's one thing that we've been playing with. Um, so especially I think we can't for some like the algae effects. And we're trying to be clever with modeling and math to at least get some sort of like attrib attribution to the different um, processes and say like, oh, at least like the correlation over time aligns with this thing causing this when, but it's going to be tough. And, um, that whole, uh, blob thing kind of ruined some of our original ability to ask some of these questions, but we're going to figure it out. I think it's, I think it's re feasible. It's just going to be a little more wishy-washy than I had hoped. Well, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Transition now back to in the room to see. for you. Oh, that's done. Yep. All right, do I advance with this? Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, Jamie, for organizing all of this. Um, last minute, putting things together. So I think it's important for the community to get together. Um, in Zoom and in person, we've got 40 on Zoom. That's great. So I'm going to. Um, talk about um, part of my work that I've been doing probably for the last 15 years. Um, and it's, I'm going to tell a story. Um, it'll be a story today. And it's going to be about this individual, Minakata Kumagusu, um, who was a biologist um, from Japan, kind of from late 1800s to um, first half of the 1900s. Um, let's see here. Forward. Sound. The bottom button. 
There we go. All right. So this is a uh, part of a book I've been working on for some time that's finally going to be out um, in March, April, depending on supply chain stuff they tell me. And um, so what I'm going to share is just a little snippet from chapter five of this book. There's a lot of stories like this um, that are not very well known. And I think it's important for us to share and learn some of these stories. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about Buddhism a little bit. And I think there's a few things we gotta um, kind of get on the same page about before we begin this. Um, Buddhism is a vastly oversimplified term. It was made up by colonial era Europeans to kind of have a shorthand way of categorizing a bunch of traditions um, and philosophies to make them seem like Western religions, um, make them easy to talk about. Um, that wasn't actually kind of how it went down or how, how, what Buddhism really is. Is that a pointer? Yeah, great. Um, so um, this map shows kind of the journey of Buddhism. Um, the Buddhist teachings originated 500 BC in the Ganges Basin, and then diversified as this, these teachings traveled across Asia um, over the centuries that followed. Um, and then one thing that's really not very well known is that as um, colonial Europeans would enter into Asia, um, and try to convert people to Christianity. Um, oftentimes Buddhists would counter and align their worldview with that of Darwinian evolution. Say, our two ways of thinking are rather similar, we're rather modern, um, but that was never taken seriously. Um, and there are all these stories kind of from the times of colonial era um, that are kind of tough to find. Um, that's kind of the truth. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little segment of this. You'll see all these different colored arrows. Um, we're going to talk about Japan today. So Buddhism came into Japan kind of fifth to seventh century, about a millennium after the Buddha died. Um, and through three vectors, there's kind of different schools of Buddhism here. Um, the red school Mahayana went in twice, once through Taiwan, once through Korea. And then what we're going to talk about mostly today is Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism that came in through the blue. Okay. I just said that. So um, we're gonna talk about an individual, Minakata Kumagusu, um, early life. Um, so he was born in 1867. He was very sickly um, and he was born into a um, Shingon family. And this was the form of Buddhism that was from that blue arrow. Um, and so what you would do when your child was born is you take them to the head bhikkhu or priest um, for naming. And the uh, priest gave this uh, infant the name Kumagusu um, by combining the term for kuma for bear uh, with gusu for um, a camphor tree. So there happened to be a camphor tree at the shrine. It was big and everybody um, thought it was awesome. And then bear for strength. So we're gonna give this child some strength. Um, and through its early years, Kumagusu really read deep significance into this. That there's a connection between me and animals and plants, and we're all kind of tied together. Um, and that tied in basically with what Buddhism taught. So early years, um, he was really interested in living things for his early life, went to the University of Tokyo for a year, um, but like many, I kind of was enamored by the idea of studying in the U.S. or in North America. Um, so he transferred um, for a transfer student from University of Tokyo to Michigan State School of Agriculture, which is today Michigan State University, um, at 19. Um, and this is where he learned about sort of Linnaean approaches to biology, um, this sort of uh, divide and define approach. And that didn't really work well with his thinking of biology. Um, but he was a pro learned about it there and um, kind of influenced his thinking. Um, oh, I guess I can take my mask off. I'll do that. Might make it a little bit easier to talk. I'm also kind of getting winded as I talk. <laughs> um, so, but then something happened. Um, I think there, there are many lessons embedded in here. Um, two of his friends in Kumagusu, well, they, had a heavy drinking incident, which is um, not something unusual in college. Um, the other two got warnings, Kumagusu was expelled. Um, don't know much beyond that, but he was expelled. 
So what did he decide to do? Oh my gosh, um, go back to Japan, no way. He would be in disgrace. Um, he, he left for Florida, he decided I'm gonna stick around North America, joined a traveling circus that journeyed through Cuba and South America. And he um, learned kind of how to study specimens and really got interested in lichens. So he was interested in examples of things that didn't fit quite so well with the taxonomic approaches of the West. Um, didn't, didn't fit those very well. So he got really interested in that. He also got really interested in languages. So he learned Spanish, German, Italian, French along the way and working knowledge in some other languages. So traveling along through the Caribbean, um, eventually made his way on a transatlantic voyage to England. So this is 1892. Um, and this is Kumagusu right here with his brother, doesn't look very happy for whatever reason, um, and some family friends. Um, and he became a regular visitor to the British Museum. So this was kind of his hangout where he hung out all the time. He worked alongside Frederick Dickens. Um, and then he really diversified what he studied. He got into astronomy, archeology, span anthropology, literature, all kinds of different things. Um, and then he actually published his first article for Nature. He ended up publishing 51 articles in Nature through his life um, about constellations of the Far East. So the topic of astronomy. Um, this is also where he encountered, you know, the writings of then very influential thinkers still today, Charles Darwin um, and others about kind of the nature of biology. Um, okay. Another person he encountered um, at the British Museum in his years in London was actually a Shingon priest um, from Japan named Doki Horyu. And um, Horyu was actually a delegate to the 1893 Parliament of Religions in Chicago, which was a big deal. Everybody from all the world's traditions gathered in Chicago and talked to one another about their worldviews. Um, and many of the people, the delegates, decided to make it a trip around the world out of it. Um, and so those two met, um, they were from the same Buddhist tradition in Japan um, and started correspondence, started writing letters to one another. And this is something that continued on for years and years and years. Um, and they were, what they wrote about to one another was sort of the um, alignments of Buddhist and scientific teachings. This continued on and on and on. Something else happened. So, you know, things were going pretty well for Kumigusu at the British Museum. He had some family to hang out with. Um, he was meeting all sorts of interesting people. Um, but then one day, in, there was an incident, another incident in 1898, where a, all we know is Mr. Thompson um, was loudly making anti-Asian slurs just around the reading room, just openly saying horrible things. Eventually encountered directly Kumagusu, said this stuff to his face. Kumagusu punched him right in the face, laid him out. Um, Kumagusu exiled from the British Museum, kicked out. Um, and it quickly became clear his time in London, no longer tenable. He, he couldn't stay there anymore. So um, he went back to Japan. And here he is on the far right. Um, so he returns to Japan, kind of, you know, no degree, um, nothing really to show in the traditional sense for his time overseas in the Americas and Europe. Um, his parents had passed on, so he wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, he went back to his home and he became a field biologist, just an amateur, going to be a field biologist. Um, so he um, took up residence at an inn next to a Shingon shrine in Nietzsche. Um, and he just stayed there and worked for the next three years. Um, these were his research assistants. They would go up into the mountains during the day and he'd collect his favorite organisms. He was really into lichens, fungi, and slime molds. Um, and then by night, he'd bring specimens back, work under a microscope, make notes, write a bunch of letters. I'm going to show you a few examples here in a minute um, to Doki Horyu. Those two just had a long term correspondence going. Um, other scientists he got to know, he read a lot of Buddhist sutras and philosophies, continued to write articles from nature. So he's submitting articles to nature, writing about biology, all kinds of different things um, from this inn in Japan. Just a few pictures. Um, this is from a museum about him. That was his microscope that he worked with and his um, supplies there for illustrations. Here are some of his illustrations of mushrooms that he saw up in the mountains. He was really into slime molds. And these are really fascinating um, organisms. 
if you're not familiar with them. Um, and he really liked them because they went, they were really befuddling to taxonomists at the time. They went back and forth between what looked like a plant-like organism and an animal-like organism in different stages of their life. So for Kumagusu, right, the bear camphor tree, he was really into this. So they have these fruiting bodies um, that come in really varied, remarkable forms. Um, they're stationary. But then, you know, he would sit and meditate and just literally watch these things for days on end. They would transform into what's a slug form over here. And it looks like a slug. And it was mobile, move around. Um, and so he saw this as um, kind of flying in the face of the European taxonomists um, and was thus really into it. Here's a letter. So um, he developed a relationship with Walter Swingle at the USDA. Um, and this kind of provides some insights into a bit of a sense of humor. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to remember. I can't read this very well. Um, so this is the end of one of his letters, um, a PS. Um, don't write my personal name as Kumagoso. So he was calling him the wrong name um, all these years, as you have done lately. Um, when you do this, it means bear's dung. <laughs> my, my name is not bear's dung. It is bear's camphor tree. Um, so anyway, I thought that was a little humorous. Um, this is what he's probably most famous for. Um, it's called the Minakata Mandala. This is a letter between he and Doki Horyu, um, the Buddhist monk. Um, and this diagram right here is called the Minakata Mandala. Um, and it's a drawn representation um, of the Buddha's cause and effect framework. So Buddhism has a form of cause and effect. Um, instead of linear cause and effect, like we're used to in the West, it's more reciprocal. Um, mutual in nature. Um, it's really fascinating um, thing to talk about, um, but it was kind of hidden in these letters, this one-on-one -on -one correspondence. Um, so in the 80s, I think it was, yep, um, Kazuko Surumi, who was a sociologist, kind of rediscovered all these letters. And she uh, thought there was enormous potential in here that all of what had been written really had some major big things to say um, about science, um, but she was never taken seriously. Um, so she presented this at meetings and all sorts of things, but it kind of just, um, she passed away, I think in the mid nineties, it all kind of dissipated back away. Okay, so um, Kumagusu, um, we spent three years in the mountains. Um, going up and collecting slime molds and fungi and other critters and bringing them back to study. One day he decided to just leave. Um, he, the story goes, just got up, started walking south um, and continued walking, collecting um, fungi and things along the way until he hit the city of Tanabe. Um, he decided to kind of settle down there. Um, so he bought a house with a garden, continued studying the slime molds in the garden, got married to the daughter of the local priest and they had some kids together. Um, but then another thing happened at this time in um, Japan. Um, there's this big effort to consolidate um, the shrines. So the Buddhist shrines were kind of um, peppered all around um, the mountainsides and they would serve local communities and they were kind of nestled off in the woods here like this. Um, so the Japanese government wanted to consolidate and have big mega shrines in the cities. And they said, you, you can go, we don't have to go to these little shrines anymore, you can go to the big ones. Um, and in so doing, however, um, that opened up the forests that were connected to these shrines to logging. And so it was sort of an insidious underlying plot um, to cut down all the trees surrounding the forests. Um, Kumagusu picked up on this and he um, wrote a bunch of letters to uh, newspapers, wrote pamphlets, just trying to stop this temple consolidation effort. And he saw, you know, kind of a connection there between the culture um, of Japan, the local culture, and the impact on biodiversity. Um, and so there was yet, I think this is the third and final incident. Um, he was drunk. Um, he stormed into a government organized meeting where they were trying to drum up support for the big mega temples. Um, and he made a big scene and got thrown in jail. Okay. Um, but um, the jailers were very befuddled because he seemed really happy in jail. He was supposed to stay there for 16 days. 
they saw him just sitting in a corner staring at something turns out he discovered a slime mold in the jail cell <laughs> and it was actually he discovered a new species of slime mold um it was his final one he discovered um and in fact when they said your time's up kumagu so you can go home he asked to stay there so that he could continue um, his analysis of the slime mold um anyway so um here he is in his later years um didn't stop all of it, but prevented a lot of destruction of thousands of these small forest shrines um, distributed on the mountainside and the surrounding biodiversity in Wakayama Prefecture. Um, he later on um, became a friend of Hirohito. Um, those two, Hirohito was also a big fan of the slime molds, um, and those two would go on walks together, and Kumagusa gifted him some slime mold specimens and taffy boxes. Um, and on one of these walks, he convinced the emperor to make a protected area out of one of the islands they saw on their walks oftentimes. Um, his health declined in the late 30s, um, got critically ill in 41, um, and those were his final words. Um, so kind of a, um, not well known outside of Japan, um, but increasingly, especially in recent years, becoming more and more well known. Um, people, there was a museum built, um, and originally in 65, renovated in 2017, um, his 150th birthday, um, and that's a picture of it right there, um, and here's a flyer from a celebration, there were celebrations all over Japan um, of Kumagusa's birthday, um, and kind of his unique way of thinking about things, and what he did that kind of went under-recognized. All of my references, and um, thanks to folks who have kind of supported me in this along the way. Um, whole slew of undergraduate students have worked with me on this broader project, been involved in great conversations. Um, Denver Lab um, of recent past, um, 2019 version, 2015 version, um, the sources of funding and other support. And um, all of this, um, I asked for permission from the city of Tanabe and the Minnakata Kumuso Museum was given permission to share all of this. Um, and that's what I got. Thank you very much. There'll be uh, one more video after questions. Question? Yep. How do you honor the current slime hole biologist view of this work? I don't know any modern slime mold biologists. Um, they, um, you know, I think my sense is they, uh, appreciate it. Um, he's got a genus named after him. Um, and that they really value like his uh, approach to conserving biodiversity, that you have to be an activist about it. Um, I think uh, he was pretty anti Western, though, and like they've been able to build DNA phylogenies, for example. Um, but they are neither plant nor animal. They're a very deep lineage. Um, so that, that's kind of some guesswork, though, on my part, too. Yep. I don't know if anyone else heard this this morning on NPR, but they were interviewing, um, I'm kind of not going to say right, but in the uh, Fauci's boss, right? The real director. The Collins. Agent. Thank you, Collins, Francis Collins. And they were talking about Francis Collins' religion, and he was basically, did anyone else hear this this morning? He basically said, and Virginia, please correct me if I misunderstood. Um, he basically said, I don't try to answer religious questions with, with my science, and I don't try to answer science questions with my religion. Is that, is that kind of what he said? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what you just presented, ostensibly, I think is really about the intersectionality between them, right? Mm -hmm. And not trying to divorce that and sort of, I guess I just wanted to know how your understanding of this work and this man influences kind of what you do now. I don't know if that's the right way to ask that. Yeah. I, mean, I guess I don't know what to say. Um, you know, I think it, you know, there's kind of two schools of thought on the relation. There's um, non-overlapping magisteria, Stephen Jay Gould thing, where the, we keep these separate. There are others who say, why not? Let's, let's talk about them together. Um, I think it's a little complicated. One, um, I don't know that it's necessarily accurate to call Buddhism a religion. Um, it is to some, um, but that again is kind of a Western category that we slapped on top of it. Um, 
And, uh, but I think it's, you know, they're valuable. They have things to say about cause and effect and things like that, that have been kind of glossed over through time. Um, that I think are, there's value there. Like what, why would we not want these two to talk to each other? Science cause and effect and Buddhist cause and effect. Um, if there's a totally separated approach, there'd never be opportunity for dialogue. There's an answer, I guess. All right, I'm gonna escape out of here. And I think there's one more video. D movie, thank you for labeling this such. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Virginia, we have a birthday set of haikus for you. Some of them are poems, um, but they're science related and research related. So this is our gift to you. Yeah. All right, here's mine. Symbiotic friends, love of... Uh... Hi, happy birthday, Virginia. Mine is not science related, but it's Virginia related. <laughs> so, the light from your room. Tells me that you're. Ships <laughs> uh, in the water facing the enemies. Life slab unity. Okay. Here's my lipids and sugars, small baby anemones. Happy birthday. All right, Virginia, we have a birthday set of haikus for you. Some of them are poems, um, but they're science related and research related. So this is our gift to you. All right, here's mine. Symbiotic friends, love of sea anemones. Happy birthday, Weiss. Oh. Hi, happy birthday, Virginia. Mine is not science related, but it's Virginia related. <laughs> so the light from your room. Tells me that you're working. I shall not bother. <laughs> so here's my uh, shrimps in the water facing the anemones. White slab unity. Okay. Here's my lipids and sugars, small baby anemones. Happy birthday, Weiss. Mine's not a haku. Okay, we grow dinos, but we avoid cyano, so one day we might know. Corals are a foe, anemone is a typo, but no one knows why so. One day we will cryo, so corals just lie low and don't turn into an albino. <laughs> All right, happy birthday! Happy birthday, birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday Virginia! So I think um, we were, those who want to, what's the plan, Jamie? Yeah, so we can go over there. If anybody's willing to break the cold, yeah, we get a Anybody playing anything? Yeah, we can go over there. To uh, Dog. They do have heaters, but I'm not sure how effective those will be. Is anyone on Zoom planning to go? Yes, I don't know if we can see in the chat. Yeah, that must have been the part Um I'll go if anyone wants to go. I'll be the first to say it. I'll, I mean I'll go with you. So, okay. But yeah, is, is anybody else? I, all right, we've got at least three. So, what? I know. I know. I know. I'm sure it'll be lovely. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Oh, you got a whole room full of books going. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>